Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, we'll share with you excerpts of a speech given by civil rights activist Thomas Todd of Chicago, along with commentary from Rupert Richardson, president of the Louisiana NAACP, and A.Z. Young, who runs the governor's office on minority affairs. In our one-to-one -one segment, Genevieve Stewart talks to Stephanie Fielding, editor of a black newspaper in Baton Rouge. She might look white, but under Louisiana law, Fielding is legally black. We close today's show with a look at the gifted and talented program in the Lafayette Parish public school system. Hello everyone, I'm Rob Hinton and we'll have those stories today on Folks. TNT is an explosive compound, but the TNT you'll be searing here is an explosive speaker. He's Thomas Todd, a civil rights activist and former president of Operation Push. Up front today, we're going to share with you excerpt of a speech Todd gave to a group of black lawyers in New Orleans. We'll also get some reaction to Todd's address from Rupert Richardson, president of the Louisiana NAACP, and A.Z. Young, executive assistant to the governor on minority affairs. In this first clip, Todd suggests that black people were traveling in a circle. We talk about progress in terms of ups and downs. We talk about progress in terms of peaks and valleys. But for blacks in America, we have gone around and around in a circle. And when we're at the top of the circle, we call it progress. And when we're at the bottom of the circle, we call it retrogression. But instead of breaking out and going up and down, we go over and over the same ground, confusing movement with progress. I've seen the evolution of a circle. Let me ask the two of you, what do you think? Are black people traveling in circles? I'm not sure that the world is not traveling in circles. We often talk about history going around and coming back. So I don't think it's any more true for black people than for anyone else. Progress is kind of in the eyes of the beholder at times, and some people get to the top of the circle and are able to cling. I get concerned, and I know Mr. Young does, when someone gets there and then does not reach down and try to pull another up. But some progress is there if any one elevates. But it cannot be mass progress until such time as those of us who have a little more opportunity, a little more education, also remember the peril of our brothers and sisters. What do you think, AZ? Are we at the progressive part of that circle that he mentioned? Uh, I think that uh, we are making a tremendous amount of progress, particularly from where I came from and the, uh, the basics for my still existing I have seen um, uh, many persons in the black community make, a, make progress beyond my expectation. And I still feel that black people in this country are still making progress, and I don't think we're at a point where we are complacent. Well, you know, I gather from his speech that he thinks when blacks have made a little ground that we have a tendency to become very complacent or quickly become complacent. Do you think that is the case? Uh, certainly, that, that, that is the case with uh, individuals, but not as a race. Nature, right. uh, there are some individuals that are complacent, but not as a race of people. We are not complacent. We are still on the move, and we are hoping to uh, reach higher goals in life. Okay, let's take a look at this next clip. And in this next clip, he says that we are a people created by law. We are a creation of legal fiat. Though we were born human in Africa, 
Though we were kidnapped and snatched and brought to this soil in 1619, we were brought here not as human beings, but we were brought here as less than human beings. White Southerners enacted statutes which took away our humanness, made us slaves, and in 1857, the Dred Scott decision said that we were less than human with no rights which a white man is bound to respect. In 1787, oh, I'm so glad I went to Southern, I learned how to read. <laughs> In 1787, when white men, oh, I didn't write this history, when white men drafted the Constitution of the United States, they were all white men. All of the founding fathers were white men. Even in the Constitution of the United States, by legal definition, black people were considered three-fifths of a person. And only then for the purposes of taxation and apportionment. We are a people created by law. Todd went on to say that the 13th Amendment gave us human status, the 14th Amendment defined us as citizens, and then that 1876 law giving us the right to vote. Do you agree with him? Are we people created by law? Well, historically, he's quite active, accurate. Legalistically, he's quite accurate. But over and beyond that, my dear friend Thomas Todd gets a little emotionalism into it that sometimes clouds the issue. Certainly there have been perhaps more statutes that deal with the freedom of black persons than any other group. But yet everyone is a creature of the law. Women are not in the Constitution for that matter. And yet, we, us, and while we still strive to get into the Constitution, we don't say that we are at the point where the last law was passed. We continue to strive. He did excellent research on that. I have since read that presentation. It is very legalistically accurate. But we are creatures of God, if you get right down to it. Whatever separates man and woman from animals and from plants, black people are just as any other people are. I don't agree with that analysis once he outlined the law. As he Todd went on to say that what America, white America makes the law and white America can't repeal the law. What white America giveth, they are now taking away. And would you agree with that? I certainly have to say that uh, we have come this far on an installment plan. <laughs> uh, we have uh, gotten and enjoyed certain rights because of certain legislation or certain uh, laws passed and certainly have to agree with the man. Uh, I have witnessed that the 1964 and 65 Civil Rights Acts and acts that give freedom to the black community was enacted and the same way those uh, legislation was enforced, those legislations can be taken away from us. So I do agree that we have to be on our guard. So if the laws don't protect us and the Supreme Court doesn't protect us, what protection do we as black people have? We have no real protection. I guess our best insurance is to continue to fight, to continue to be vigilant, to continue to be vi visible. But you see, as far as these laws are concerned, I can honestly say that, as he said, well, maybe not white man, but anyway, the law giveth and taketh away. There is always room left to take away. A Civil Rights Act of 64 had to be renewed in 84. This was a way of saying, hey, if we don't like the way you're acting, it is not guaranteed. A Voting Rights Act had to be uh, reaffirmed. And each time that reaffirmation comes up, there are attempts to take something away from it, to find some way to make it less protective of black rights. So we have to band together in every way. You know I'm not going to avoid saying organizations like the NAACP are at the vanguard of our rights. People like Mr. Young are at the vanguard of our rights. A Ben Jeffers, a Dutch Morial. If we did not have these individuals and these organizations, perhaps when the 84 Civil Rights Act came up for reenactment, Perhaps someone would say, oh, everybody's free now. We don't need it, knowing full well that even with it on the books, we are not free. We're hearing more talk today about budget cuts in 85. Should we be gearing up again? I think, I think that uh, any time uh, the Congress make a move on terms of budget cuts, the first area of cuts usually happen to the persons who are less able to afford it. 
And certainly I think we should be gearing up and we should stay on guard 24 hours a day in order to protect those persons who are unable to protect themselves. Okay. In this next clip, ta talks about what could be the future of black America. Let's take a look. If the present trends continue, I predict that in 20 years, our children's children will live in the conditions which we faced in the 1940s and 50s in this nation. I predict that if the present trends continue, that in 50 years from now, the children of our children's children will be in rank segregation. And I predict that if the trends continue as they are today, that 100 years from today, that blacks in America could be in formal slavery. Well, if he's right, and I hope he's not right, our future and our children's future could be mighty grim. What do you think? Oh, and I don't think he intended it to be a prediction. That's poetic license. I think he was throwing it out as a challenge that unless this audience, which was pre predominantly black lawyers, unless they recognize the weaknesses of our position, unless they recognize the right to fight, unless they recognize that they must be dedicated to the whole struggle for human equality, that this could happen. I am also an orator, and I know how you have to, quote unquote, incite in order to start people to thinking, and that speech has certainly done that. We have found in the Civil Rights Movement that we have, since that meeting, gotten more black lawyers to come back and say, I'll take a case for you sometimes, whereas all before that it was purely mercenary. Lay it on the line right here and sign on the line. Yes, I know you're about civil rights, but we've got to make a living. He threw out a challenge to them to do something to stop us from going back into segregation, and it is effective. I appreciate it. In light of what we've seen over the last four years under Reaganism, do you think that blacks are going to become more excited during the next four years under our second term? Personally, uh, we, are, we as people usually respond when there's a crisis situation. And we are faced with a crisis situation here in 1984, and I think that the black population nationwide will come closer together and work for the benefit of one another. Next week, we'll have more comments from Todd and more reaction from Richardson and Young. One of Baton Rouge's minority-oriented newspapers, The Examiner, experienced a good degree of success with a high standard of writing and sensitive understanding of problems in the black community. Now, some persons wondered how this was achieved with a white editor. Well, Genevieve Stewart is here to enlighten us on this unique editor. Genevieve? Rob, The Examiner's editor describes herself as looking like a refugee from the Irish potato famine. In fact, Stephanie Fielding is a native Hawaiian who was legally considered black under Louisiana's 132nd law. She is a walking United Nations of sorts. Fielding moved to Baton Rouge with her blonde, blue-eyed children, who are also legally designated black, and became editor of the city's newest minority newspaper. The Examiner was visually attractive, sleek in its style. The paper was widely accepted for its upbeat approach and extensive coverage of politics and business. Unfortunately, the Examiner was put to bed and ceased publication shortly after its first birthday. This interview was taped prior to the Examiner's closing. We felt that Stephanie Fielding's story still has merit and appeal. Stephanie, you were raised in Hawaii. When you moved to Louisiana, you were legally black under Louisiana law. How is that? Well, because I'm 1 16th black. And uh, in Louisiana, they, if you're a 32nd black, you uh, are considered black. My children also, my blonde-haired, blue-eyed children are black. <laughs> it all seems really rather ridiculous to me because I have, um, I'm also part Hawaiian and I'm also part Chinese and part Indian. How I turned out looking like a refugee from the potato blight in Ireland, I have no idea, but um, that's how it works sometimes, I guess. Was this a revelation to you? It was something that I enjoyed. <laughs> I mean, I've known that I've, I'm part black for a long time, but um, to be considered uh, that th that's what you are because you're, you know, 1 16th black, hey. 
<laughs> that's a little bit different. In Hawaii, uh, you know, we had the, the king and queens and when we were growing up in high school and things. And they always had, um, uh, since there are beauties in each, you know, culture, in each race, you'd have a Japanese queen and a Chinese queen and a Hawaiian queen and a Portuguese queen and a Caucasian queen. And you'd also have a cosmopolitan queen. And um, so it, it's, it's something that, that people in Hawaii are proud of, their ancestry. And, and I am proud of it. What brought you to the Baton Rouge Examiner? I went and sat in the park and I said some prayers. And one of the things that I wanted to do while I was here was to get in contact with the black community. And I didn't know, I mean, all of my husband's contacts at the university were white. I didn't know how to do it, really. And so I, I sat down and I said two prayers, one that I get in contact with the black community and, um, and the other was that I get a job. And at the end of that, I, it occurred to me that what I should do is to write um, an ad to all these people and to say, this is your last chance to hire this wonderful person. <laughs> and so I wrote this ad up and I took it to um, a typesetter. And um, while it was being typeset, I said, by the way, do you have any clients that need a, a writer? And they said, well, if you don't mind working for a black newspaper. And I went, D don't mind, I was sure. And it happened about two minutes later, the then editor of the Examiner walked in. And she read my, my samples that I had and, and liked it. As a white, possibly female, editor of a black newspaper, have you had much difficulty being accepted? Yes. <laughs> I have. Uh, there are people that, that don't believe I should be here. Um, there are white people that don't believe that uh, a white woman should be editor of a black newspaper, and there are black people that believe that a white woman shouldn't be editor of a black newspaper. So I've gotten it from both sides, but primarily, I mean, the people that have, have gotten to know us have seen that Kermit and I work together very well, that we complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. and. Um, and that, that we're a good team. And I don't, I don't think it really matters. And the people that, uh, that have seen us work together don't seem to think that it matters. And I think that the other people are, you know, it, it's more a prejudicial thing rather than anything else. What is the examiner's editorial thrust or policy? Perception is reality. And as, as I see that in, in, with the examiner, um, often black newspapers will, will say that, you know, well, this is who raped who, and this, is, this, this person just got mugged, and, and it, it's a clipper service, and, and it presents the black community in a negative way. And our thrust is to uh, present the black community in a positive way so that that perception will will grow beyond the negative and uh, so that that the black community will have very positive role models that the children will grow up seeing at a close distance and when when we say about talk about expansion we're not going to you know, pick up the Baton Rouge Examiner and take it to New Orleans we're going to start the New Orleans Examiner and the, the point is that um, people, you, you, they have Jet and they have um, Ebony, and they see the successes there, but those are successes in New York and in, in Los Angeles and Chicago. They're not here, you know? And that's what we're doing. We're saying that, look, these people are here, they're successful, they're wonderful, they're exciting, and you can do the same thing. And, um, and that, that's, the, that, that's what we want to get across. And when people can see success is closer to home, when it becomes, when, when perfection and success and wonderful things are, are closer and more accessible, 
more people are going to reach for them. And when more people are reaching for those things and looking towards goals higher than, than what they are looking for, they're going to reach higher goals. Maybe they won't become president of the United States, but what heck, maybe they become mayor. And, and so that's what we're, we're hoping for. The examiner was also a catalyst for shaping events. It was, among other things, instrumental in integrating the Chamber of Commerce and devising a reader's poll to recognize outstanding black citizens. Stephanie's pride in what the paper achieved is fully justified. We're proud of, of the response that we've received from the community. People calling up and saying, we really needed this you know this is a great paper it's wonderful I, i'm glad to identify with it i'm happy to be black this is you know this is making uh it's it's a wonderful impact it's had a wonderful impact on the community um it, people telling us that they're proud of it you know that's what makes us most proud stephanie fielding's story is not a moratorium she has opened the doors of Fielding Words, a public relations firm. The examiner's founder, Kermit Thomas, is now publishing the Baton Rouge Metro, another quality product. There is hopefully a world of success awaiting Stephanie Fielding and the Baton Rouge Metro. We close today's show by taking a look at some gifted youngsters as we visit the gifted and talented program in the Lafayette Parish public school system. There are close to 600 children in the gifted and talented program in the Lafayette Parish public school system, beginning with preschool age through high school. The program caters to the academically gifted. What does it mean to be a gifted child? In our program, we're only working with academically gifted children. There are many forms of gifted. There's talented and physically gifted. But this program is set up to serve the academically gifted child. That is one who is expected to do better than average in the academic setting, two standard deviations above the norm as far as IQ goes, or exceptional achievement in reading or math. So how does a parent know if his or her child is gifted? There's a testing program throughout the parish. All children who rank on their SRA score, their standard scores, above the 90th percentile should be tested for the gifted program. And uh, the classroom teachers go through their files at the end of the year and recommend students, or they can be identified throughout the year, too. In addition to testing, there are other qualities to look for. Some gifted children are strong leaders in the classroom, relate very well to other students, and get along exceptionally well. Others are rather shy and uh, introverted. I think that. Um, gifted children are like everyone else as far as personality characteristics. Some are very highly creative. That's something that we look for, the one who has a different answer to the question. Not always the one that the teacher had in mind, but something that is logical in their mind. The gifted program in the Lafayette Parish Public School System provides the students and parents with two options, academic acceleration or academic enrichment. Academic acceleration program starts uh, for the most part in the sixth grade here at Palbro, they can transfer here as a magnet school. And we offer uh, science, math, social studies, reading, language, or French. And then in addition to that, they take their PE and whatever elective they choose to take, like band or chorus, or speech, with the regular student body. So they're mixed part of the time they're in advanced classes and part of the time they're, with, they're on peers. Here we are visiting the gifted and talented program housed at the Paul Burrell School. The students here call their program Project Think. Our junior high program had decided they needed a name. They, they were feeling a little uncomfortable being the gifted program all the time. So we had a, a contest and the children decided that they would be Project Think, which is an acronym for Talented Humans Investigating New Knowledge. And then they used the word puzzles using the word think. And there are five in here. At the top, it's think for yourself. This one is think about it. This one's think it over. Think twice. And then if you think of this as a bubble showing what the think is thinking about, it's think ahead. And this is our logo and our, an acronym for our program. In the primary grades, uh, those students are labeled high potential rather than gifted. And 
up to the third grade, and we have another program called the Wonder Whys that sort of ties in with their curious questioning attitude and always asking and being highly interested. What roles do the teachers and the parents play in the development of a gifted child? I think that a gifted child, like everyone else, I think their primary need for so long and all the way through high school is for affection and understanding and communication. Uh, with a gifted child, sometimes that understanding means that they need a wider variety of activities, earlier exposure to some higher level thinking skills that challenge them and interest them before it would another child. Uh, but most of all, I think they need to be treated with love and, and talked to and, and encouraged. And what about other needs? I think they need to be um, challenged at their own rate, which is a need that a regular child has, but that's met in different ways for a gifted child. I think they also need to be understood that sometimes they reach that age of questioning and doubting and understanding themselves at a younger age. Sometimes that period that many students go through in high school, the gifted child will go, begin to go through in upper elementary or junior high. And we found a need to address that problem. There's a lot of questioning and doubting sometimes in a gifted child at a younger age. And how does the environment in the gifted and talented program differ from the attention that a student might get in a private institution? I have a strong feeling that gifted children need more than straight acceleration. And in some schools, apparently there is an acceleration component in, in some private schools that is, that is very good. And, uh, but in addition to that, we have acceleration four days a week, and one day a week we have this enrichment program. And that's part of what you'll see today, too. The computer lab is part of our enrichment program, which works on higher level thinking skills. We do a minimum amount of computer literacy and go directly with the fourth graders into writing programs and graphics. Uh, they have a strong art program for the creatively gifted child. We have a program with dramatics. We do a lot of plays, a lot of Hamlet, Shakespeare, uh, then some comedies, some that they make up. They make up their own soap operas and we have dinner time theaters where we invite the parents and the other students in. And uh, we feel like that the performing arts and the communication arts are, are as strong a need as the computers because if they can l learn to communicate what they know, that's a large part of what they'll need in life. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week on Folks, we'll have more from Thomas Todd, and Genevieve will be talking to Dr. Stella Jones of New Orleans. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>